welcome to The Creative Influencer, where we discuss all things creative with an emphasis on influencers. The Creative Influencer is hosted by John Pfeiffer. John is an entertainment attorney in Santa Monica, California, who represents influencers and other creatives. This is episode five of the first season of the Creative Influencer podcast. Today, we interview Kayla Methvin. Kayla is a fashion designer, dominatrix, heiress, CEO of her own business, and an influencer with over 1 million Instagram followers. Kayla is a unique personality that you're going to enjoy. I am joined today by Kayla Methvin. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, John, and thank you so much for having me. You are many things. But I want to talk about five of them. Oh, oh okay. You are a fashion designer. Yes. You're a dominatrix. Yes. You are an heiress. Yes. You're the CEO of your own business. Yes. And you're an influencer. Yes. You have over a million Instagram followers. Yes. Okay. So, in order to really oh, understand... Oh, wait. You forgot the most important thing. Which is... I'm also remarkable. <laughs> <laughs> and remarkable. Where's my pen? <laughs> okay, well, let's talk about remarkable first. Okay. Um, which, actually, let's talk about the fashion designer. All right. When you were 16, you moved to France. Yes. And I've heard the story of you 14. went... 14. 14? 14. And I heard the story of you went to see a fashion show. I did. Can you tell us that story? I will. So, it all started, basically... Um, you know, sadly, when I was 14, my, my mother was very ill, and uh, she passed away. And I never met my dad before, so I ended up taking the plane. I had two choices. It was either foster care, or it was either go meet your dad. So I was like, okay, what are we going to do here? And where was your dad living? In Paris. Paris. So, of course, the obvious decision was go meet your father. So I ended up going to France, and I attend um, the international... Um, high school academy, you know, where a lot of, like, ambassadors and kids go, et cetera, et cetera. And did you speak French? I did not speak French. So I was lost. I was in, in the middle of winter. I was in flip-flops, Abercrombie ripped jeans back, you know, in the days, and a T-shirt that said I love whatever, you know? Uh, I was typically your non-French person. I was very lost in the city. I had no friends. I had just lost my mother. I was very uncreative at that moment. I was very desperate, and I had I was in a family with four brothers and sisters and a stepmother that I I didn't know and I couldn't communicate with. You know, so I was going through a lot of depression. I was going through a lot of a lot of sadness and grief at that moment. You know, and originally I've always wanted to be a lawyer. You know, um, and I knew that that was no longer going to be possible after the death of my mother. And, you know, my father does speak English, so we did have some type of communication, but he is a Muslim, and, you know, he, he does practice a certain way of living, and we come from different culture differences, right. you know, different backgrounds. So it all So you have a double whammy of coming from the United States and... Beverly Hills Mansion, all the way to the suburbs in a one-bedroom apartment with seven people living in it. I slept on the, be- on the kitchen floor for two years. And I worked three jobs. So it was, it was, it was Cinderella, I call it Cinderella upside down. But okay. you know what it taught me? It taught me how to be human and the value of money and how to love people no matter what. So going back to the fashion, um, I was very unhappy. And so you know what I decided to do one summer? I said, you know what? Two years has gone by. Um, I'm going to, it was like a year and a half has gone by and, uh, I was like, you know, I'm going to enter in this three-month um, makeup course. Why not? You know, make some friends. And, uh, you know, I spoke a little broken French, we shall say. And I went there, and I, and I had a remarkable time. I met friends today who now have babies, who are now married, and have great lives in France. And I remember going to this fashion show. You know, it was Dior's fashion show. And it was at Trocadero, and it was in the aquarium underneath the Eiffel Tower. And I remember that when I was interning as a makeup artist and I was holding brushes and, and you know, like tissue paper and, and just being the girl on the side, in the corner, in the dark. The makeup girl. Yeah. And, and, you know, also all my life, I've always felt like the girl in the dark. 
I never felt like I was ever the girl in the light. But anyways, Are you back, the girl in the light now? I'm the girl in the light now, but back then I wasn't. And I just remember the crowd when the when these models walked, everyone stopped talking. People were like oohed and awed. I saw that their eyes were captured, their souls were taken. I could see how they appreciated the clothing. I could see how they appreciated the theater of it. I could see how they appreciated every single second of work that went into making this collection. It was telling a story in 15 minutes and taking the souls of everyone, of 200 people, and making them believe in a story of Dior. Now, how, when you, I've heard you say that before, the, yeah. the story, the 15 minute story. I'll explain it. Yeah, please. How do you so, tell a story like basically, that? Basically, let's take a movie. Let's take Jurassic Park. That's really out at the moment. It's hit the box office. It's going crazy. So there's always an A, B to Z. Right. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. Well, in fashion, you have 15 minutes, basically, to do an A to a Z. And how you do that is, is you do it by color palettes, and you do it by certain cuts, and you do it by certain accessories. And what story are you telling? What is your inspiration? Is it the Roman Empire? Is it Greek? Is it theatrical? Is it lingerie? Is it wedding? So what are you, what feeling are you giving off to your clientele and to your target audience? What are you trying to tell the audience? Are, like, is your collection, is your collection, for example, if you have all this theatrical music, that's, that's from like Mark Jacobs, he always put on, he always puts on opera for some reason. You know, and he always wants his models to walk very slow. Because he's very tense right now. So his story is really pay attention to the details and really look because these, this is very couture. This, now your this, fashion shows that you put on a jumping, a little, uh, jumping ahead a little bit, do you tell a different story at each show? No, I tell the same story because each 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 brand you have to stay stick to your brand identity. You can't you can't go in and you can't all of a sudden go, it's like changing your name. You can't just go in and change the name. So, so you are at this fashion show. When did you decide that that's what you wanted to do? When I saw when I heard a man say that dress looks remarkable on this woman, and I said, you know what? I can do a better job. This is meant for me. I know that I can, I can, I can do this show ten times better. And I said, I'm going to steal the hearts and souls of everyone, and I'm going to bring smiles to everyone's face. And when did you start? I started. Uh, I entered S mode. I was 17. So they take 3,000 um, interviews and only 40 enter. How long a program is it? Oh my God, it was three years bachelor's. I did a one year master's and a one year uh, MBA. Yeah. So I did a lot of studies. Did you stay in Paris after that uh, for a period of time before you moved back to the United States, or did you move back there immediately? So after you got out of school, what did you do? Oh, it's, no, it's because I traveled in school as well. Oh, that's okay. why. That's why I got confused. Um, no, in school I traveled to China, Shanghai, London, and New York. Okay. So that's why I was a little <clears> confused. But after my studies, I went to go live in New York to try and pursue because I already interned for Vogue. So I went to go try and pursue living there. But since, you know, the city was so crazy, I didn't know anyone, I didn't have any ground roots, I didn't grow up there, I didn't have any friends. And then on top of it, I was stuck on Hurricane Sandy. So then, you know, the lights were turned off and for three days I was basically stuck in a room with no water, no electricity, cold out of my mind, no heater in the middle of winter. And it was so funny. So, so as soon as the electricity turned on, the... The TV, sh the the movie, um, with the guy from Pretty Woman, what's his name? Richard Gere. Richard Gere, what's that? Jigolo. Turned on. He's standing there on the Holland Drive with his shirt unbuttoned, and I'm like, you know what? Screw it. <laughs> I'm gonna book my. And right then and there on my phone, I booked my ticket. I packed my bag, and I was at I was at JFK within two hours. I left all my stuff behind. I called my housekeeper the next day. I said I'm no longer living in New York. Packed my stuff. I'm moving to LA. So I took a little um, here down in Venice, across the Venice suite. It's a little cute, uh, it's like a hotel apartment thing. Right. I stayed there for three weeks, and the day I arrived, I opened the curtains, and I see this woman with a jukebox roller skating on Venice Boulevard. I see the sun, I see the beach. And after, you have to think of it, after the desperation of, of being 14 years old, and then you're coming back at the age of 22, I haven't seen the ocean 
in that type of way. You haven't been back to your roots. You haven't been back since your mom passed away. You haven't, you haven't, you know, relived this. So you're you're back here with the joys of sunny California, the land of dreams, the land of angels, you know. And I, I said, you know what? That's it. I'm staying here. That's it. That's my decision. I'm living here. And three weeks later, I got an apartment. When did you start designing lingerie? Oh, I was, uh, it was my second year when I was in uh, my bachelor's program. How did you pick lingerie? Well, I fell in love at a very early age with a French man. And uh, I actually had my eye on him ever since I was uh, 14. And I met him in, in high school. And uh, he looked like Lenny Kravitz. He would wear big fur and jewelry and he would smoke a cigarette like a French man and drink coffee with his pinky, you know, sticking out. And I was looking at him and you know what? It was funny, it was my first day of school. It was love at first sight. Well, I think I loved him at first sight. I don't think he loved me. <laughs> and he was a senior and I was, um, what do you call ninth grade, sophomore, sophomore? Uh, freshman. Freshman, freshman. I was a freshman, finishing up my freshman year. And, uh, and uh, I was just so attracted to him because he seemed so sophisticated and, and stunning and rich. And, <laughs> and, and, and he looked like he spoke French and Greek and Spanish and had all this jewelry on him. With, he had no shirt underneath and it was snowing with this big fur jacket and he had hair like Lenny Kravitz. And, I, and he was wearing all these rings and I was just like, I was like, wow, that's really intimidating and sexy, you know? Like, anyways, he looked at me while I walked up the staircase. Um, the first day of school, because my teacher took me out for lunch to welcome me to the school. And uh, while I was walking up the stairs to the cafe where you sit and eat, because in France you have an hour and a half of lunch break. It's not like here in America where you take your lunch break whenever, or it's 30 minutes, or you eat at your desk, or, you know, we're workaholics in America. Uh, as in Paris, they take the time to live. Anyways, I remember walking up the staircase and he looked up. And I said, I want him. I'm going to have him. He's going to fall in love with me, whether he likes it or not. And I got what I wanted. And did he? Oh, he did. Oh, boy, he did. So we didn't officially start dating until I was 16 because, you know, uh, there, wasn't, there was an age difference. There was also the fact that, you know, I was still adapting to the living circumstances for my father. I hadn't gotten a job yet. You know, I hadn't circulated any money pocket yet. And, um, you know, I would go to the uh, little uh, parties that they would have at the high school, but I, you know, I, was shy. I, would just, I, was, I would always say, like, hi, bonjour, ça va, you know, but I was also very, very shy, and, uh, you know, I was, I was not your typical uh, girl. I tried to be, and I became one at the end, but, you know, as a kid, I was not your fanciest swan, we would say. I mean, I, let's, let's say how it is. I was... I had pimples, I had buck teeth, I was overweight, I was chunky, and I was wearing flip-flops when it was snowing. I had no sense of what I was doing. I mean, you would never have seen me as a fashion designer as now. I don't so you went from no style to, to everything. And do you know what, what that was? When my mother died, it was the grief and the creativity that made me happy again. That's what brought it out. That's why I went to the makeup school. And then I noticed my creativity was so good and that I had the gift of painting. I had no idea that I could draw. I had no idea that I could paint. I had no idea. So that's when I discovered, I was like, oh my God, you're good at this. Take it further, Kayla, go further. So I said, all right, let's get into design. Then my sketches were brilliant. All right, let's get into draping. Then my draping was brilliant. And I just, I just found out that my hands could do so much. Uh, you're dating Lenny Kravitz. So I'm dating Lenny Kravitz, and why I got into lingerie is, is because I use the persuasion of lingerie to make him fall in love with me. You know, I felt that I wasn't the it girl. I didn't feel like I was that French, typical, rich bourgeoisie that he would want. And uh, so I worked three jobs, and every weekend I would either go to Pipi Chacanil or Coco Chanel or... You know, and I would buy the most expensive lingerie. I would arrive at his door, give him a little strip tease, and uh, get it on. And um, we did this on a, on a, uh, on a weekend basis uh, for a couple of years. And um, 
it ended up, you know, we started doing trips together and then emotions came into it and then we started traveling Europe together and, you know, in the end, we, we ended up together. And when did you start designing your own lingerie? You were buying it. I was buying it, When yeah. did you start designing it? My second year of my bachelor's program because the first year they teach you the techniques basically of uh, the woman and the woman's body, of how you can drape, how basically you can pattern draft, but in the second year you can major in what you want. And how long did it take you to develop the style that you have today? Your designing style? I would say that my designing style probably came in, uh, I would probably have to say, in my master's program in art, because I missed, I did master's in art theater. So I, I mixed the theatrical with that. Um, so yes, I, I mixed the theatrical with that, and and basically I took lingerie and I took theater and I and I mixed it. And there was one inspiration of mine that I did for my third year in my bachelor's program because you get to run your first fashion show, and I did it with the Westwood's house. And do you still have any of the garments from your first show? I do, and they're on my Instagram. You can actually see it. It's the one with the woman walking and the feathers in the back. Uh, I have a few. I have a few of those photos. I need to post those, but um, I will definitely send those over to you. And uh, that was my first real fashion show. So by the, that's how you pass. That's your final test. Your final test is you have to put on a fashion show. And if the judges um, apply, these are real judges, real designers. Vivian Westwood was there. Uh, John Charles de Castelbach was there. These are real designers judging you. Are you good enough to go inside their houses? Do you get to go to the next level? And you passed. Well, out of 40 kids, out of three years, only 20 get through. Oh, really? And if you miss more than three days of school, you're out. And if you arrive late on time, the door is locked and you get an X mark. It says if you missed a day of school. Very strict. It's one of the top schools. John Gilliano went there. Uh, oof, I can't remember the Gucci. So many people come to Garçon went there. They actually fell in love there. They met there and fell in love and made their own brand. So there's so many legends come from S mode. And it's such a brilliant school. So anyways, back to what I was saying is my brilliance of the whole mixing the theatrical with the lingerie came from the masquerade ball. And the masquerade ball, actually, what people don't know is, is that it was made in the 13th century. And back then, they would import and export silk from China. You know, they would do trade. And in Venice, what they would do is, when they would receive the silk, they would tell by the time of the year, because um, it was the 13th century, through the astrology and the stars, and through the time well, because you know they didn't have clocks. So August 11th was the first mass grade ball, and they would spend the entire year making their costumes. And the more theatrical the costume, the better. But you couldn't, it's kind of like, you know, that movie with Nicole Kidman, and oh, what's that movie called? Um, yeah. I, I know what you, I know what you're talking about. Right, right. It's basically a long masquerade ball. Basically. And basically it was you, kings and princesses can come from all over Spain, France. I mean, you could be a, a baker, you could be a handsmaid, you could you could be ever, anyone you wanted that night. The only thing you had to do was wear a costume. And so it started off with the balls, dancing, it was a feast, and then it turned into an orgy. So that's how it originally originated, orgy, the Greek word. And they kept having that ball every single time. So that's where my dominatrix twist turned into my fashion collection. Perfect segue to dominatrix. Right. What is your definition of dominatrix? Oh my God, I, I feel like for every woman it's different because, you know, you can either be a submissive, you can either be, you know, depend, it depends on the situation. You know, for example, if a client comes to me, she's like, okay, you know, me and my husband are thinking about getting divorced or we're thinking about, you know, things aren't working out right. And I'm like, just choke him and smack him. And she's like, what? And I'm like, well, basically what you're doing is the behavioral science behind it is if you take away his power, he feels like there's more power to give into you. So that's why I use different types of whips, different types of feathers, different types of chains, ropes, and techniques on, you know, my boyfriend, for example, for different reasons. 
you know. So for me, a dominatrix is really a, it, 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 you can look at it as many many ways. You can look at it as a woman who is a doctor, who is helping 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 men receive pleasure because they they can't. You can look at it as, as a dominatrix as a woman who 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 affiliates herself with um, with sex toys. You can look at a dominatrix as somebody who is into the submissive world, you know? I'm the dominatrix about falling in love again. Here's the difference between therapy and being a dominatrix psychologist, in a way, even though that doesn't exist uh, in a degree, but it does exist in a way. A therapist is gonna sit down and she is going to hear your problems out loud and she's going to give you certain advice on how to fix your relationship. Now, the base of a real relationship starts off with three things. It starts off with first thing is sexually. Do, are you sexually attracted to this person? That is the first thing anyone who has been married or in a couple sees with the eye. It's a visual. Am I sexually attracted to you? Second, is communication, laughter. Can this person entertain me? And then third is, of course, finance, living, and can we be comfortable together? The, that's what makes, you know, love intertwine, you know? But that's the most important. But the first one is visualization. Hearing and then everything else that are, you know, other... Um, components. Components, yes. So... What's different with a the therapist is she's not going to say go initiate. But with dominatrix, I'm going to say go initiate. And then how, is, how do your designs factor into that? Okay. So I've actually, I know a lot of dominatrixes. Um, I know a lot of dungeons in LA. I, 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 you know, they'll come to me and ask me, can I borrow this for a cover? Can I borrow this for a shoe? A lot of them, you know, use my stuff for online, um, for their web, for everything. And, um, they're actually the sweetest people in real life. You would never guess when you see them in the street. Um, um, but I'm sorry, what was I'm, I lost? Oh, how, how 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 the the dominatrix the concept of the dominatrix factors into your design. Right. So basically, you know, I made it so that you know I know that everything is when I well I think what I need to do is start off with how did I become one. And then, let's let's start there. Yeah, how, how did I become one? So when I was in Florence, Italy, doing my MBA program at Fasashi Polimoda, I basically was in a cafe drinking my Brunello red wine and having my blue cheese. Like every day after school, that was my cafe. I had to sit there for four months and, you know, while I was doing my credits there. And one day, this Asian woman walks in and she's American. And she starts talking to me. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. And I'm like, what do you do? She's like, I'm a dominatrix. How old was she? I think 30s. And she goes, yeah, my dungeon's just down the street. You want to check it out? And it was a small dungeon, very small. And I said, how long have you been here? She's like, well, she's like, I'm based in Rome. But she's like, I have clients in Florence, Milan, and Venice. So I'm like, oh, OK, so you, so you travel. So you're, pretty, you're a pretty big dominatrix. Like, you're pretty well known to afford all these right. apartments and, and everything to pay the rent. It's expensive, like, in Italy. I mean, come on. And, it, and you know, and it was really elegant. It was really beautiful. It looked like um, it was very Renaissance. It looked like a hotel lobby of the peninsula with chains everywhere. So that's how she decorated it. It was gorgeous. You had like Michelangelo angels on top on the roof, and the ceiling was painted. And then you would have like all of the whips and everything laid out. And it was really beautiful. She didn't lay it out in a in a scary red room way, you know. And uh, I think that's where I also opened up my softness and my fantasy and dreams in it. So I said to her, teach me. I want to know. I want to know what is, what, why do you do this? What's in it for you? Did you have any hesitancy in teaching you? No, no, not at all. Because uh, we got very drunk that night and uh, we were very eager. She showed me that night. And the next day after school, bam, I ran there. I was so eager. She was like, okay, well, this is for this, this is for that, this is what I do for here, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and then, you know, I was like, what is this cage for? She's like, oh, you just stick them in the cage and you just sit on top of it. And I'm like, they pay you to do this? She's like, yeah, I'll stick them in the cage for one day. 
and just feed them cookies. And I'm like, wow. I'm like, does that work? She's like, she's like, top CEOs, executives, everyone, they feel like they have so much power, they need to be depowered sometimes. So it's all about the shift of power. The shift of power. But I used it as a shift of power in relationships. And I said, how can I fix relationships? Because the divorce rate in, in, in the U.S. is 80%, which is so sad. Back in the day, our parents would never get divorced. No more grandparents, you know? You know, when I plan on getting married, I'm going to get married once, and then that's it. Death to us part. <laughs> but uh, we'll see. I mean, it's LA. Probably get married five times, who knows? But um, moving forward from there, she was a lovely lady. I'm still in contact with her today. And, uh, is she still living in Italy? Yeah, she still lives in Italy right now. Uh, but she does come to the U.S. in New York. So hopefully I'll see her during uh, New York Fashion Week. We were talking actually the other day uh, on Facebook. So she's doing good, but she's getting older now. So she's get, it's getting time to retire no, for good. her. But she was very into the whole latex and leather um, component. And, uh, you know, she was very into my designs. So it was kind of, we really did, and we didn't have a big age difference. She was young, she was only in her late 20s, and I was in my early 20s. So it was really cool to kind of, you know, connect with somebody where I'm like, okay, I'm a lingerie designer, and I'm here to study, you know, the whole marketing and advertising techniques of it. And you're a dominatrix, and, you know, you're here basically to submit to all these men and all your clients. And, you know, I would share to her everything I learned and my designs and everything. And she would just, it was just exchange of just a friendship that grew. She didn't charge me anything. She, it was really just an easy, fun thing. And you know, we would go out to lunch, we would go, we would go out for drinks. Really, Florence is small. You could walk Florence in three days. So we would hang out. Um, and I want to transition to Eris because it'll make sense in a second while I want to go there now. Okay, sure, yeah. Um, your family owned the company that one time supplied 90% of the chicken to KFC. Yeah, Rainbow Chicken Limited. Why didn't you just live off that? Why start your own business? Very good question. Um, well, I would have to first start off with that, you know, my grandfather, he started this company, you know, and it taught me a lot about success and it taught me a lot about how he how he put in all his heart and effort. And even when he had the money, he kept going. He even when he had twelve million factories full of two million chickens per day he was killing, he would still still go and sweep out the the dead chickens, even though he didn't have to do it, because he was a dedicated man. He was a real business man, and it was in his heart at the end of the day, and he came from nothing. Why am I not a kid who runs around in jets and Lamborghinis? It's because I made a promise to my mother before she died. Um, she died of suicide, by the way. And I made a promise to her that I would leave my hand mark on this wall, no matter what. And my mom was given that money as well. Um, she was given a heritage and she didn't do anything with it. And I saw, I saw what it did for her and I didn't want the same um, like, long term for me. And I knew that I had much, I was gifted with so much. And so was my mother, but she didn't know how to use it. And I made that promise and I promised it to myself mo mostly and to God that I said, I'm going to go so far no matter what, whatever it takes, you know, I'm just going to write it. And you started your own company. And I started my own company and, and it hurts sometimes. It really does. You know, I, I couldn't see this honestly 10 years ago, if I told you that you would be doing this, you'd be the cover of this, you'd do this, you'd be the cover of Maxim, you would be like on television networks, you would meet all these famous people, you'd dress celebrities, and you'd be in over 100 magazines if you Google you, you'd have like over 15,000 searches. I'd be like, what? I'd be like, that's no way. Like, my dream was to be a simple little seamstress designer for a fashion house. I never thought this was going to become this big. Um, but you know what? I got up every day and I just believed in I believed in it. I believed in my mother. I never thought she left me. I always 
kept it by my side. I kept I kept praying. Um, I'm, not, I'm a big Christian of faith. I'm an Episcopalian Christian. I go to church every Sunday, and every Sunday, I don't ask God for anything. But what I do ask for God, I said, make me a better person than that was the day before. And I say, please bless all those around me and make me the better businesswoman that I can be and the better person that I can be. And the name of your company is? Madame FN. Of course. And I want to change my name, actually, to Madame Kayla FN. So I'm thinking about it, because right now I'm Kayla Fazai FN, and I haven't really used it at all. So I'm kind of thinking of it. And uh, I feel like I'm ready to take that next step, because I feel like I'm a new person. And I'm definitely, you know, I feel like my fairy tale is happening. A lot of great things are in the works. I mean, and I feel like, you know, someone told me I should write a book before I'm 30. And I really feel like I need that name change. So it can be that I met them before she's 30. So yeah, there you have the title for your book right there. Right there. And uh, and I feel like there, there, I have so many inspirations that I want to write in this book. You know, this person told me to write this book. And, uh, there's so much I want to say to all these girls and all these young boys who are scared, you know, during the LGBT, the Me Too movement, um, through a lot of things to, to, to embrace success, love yourself, and just move forward no matter what in every life lesson learned, you know, and not to, and, and never give up and have courage. As a young entrepreneur, mm -hmm. what has been your biggest challenge? Courage. What has been... Courage, uh, definitely. What has been some of the common myths that you, you've you had to fight? Oh, I've had to fight everything. I've had to fight, I've had to fight up an army. You know, I mean, and here, mix it. CEO, heiress, model, influencer. You're going to come and have a million people attacking you daily. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, my, I have to turn off my uh, Instagram comments because of death threats. I have to, I have to. I have to be careful. I can't, um, you know, if I'm ever to go on a date or anything, you know, uh, I'm in a relationship right now, but if I was to ever go into, on a date or anything, I can never ever show where I live. Um, I'm very, people are always trying to launch on to me, saying I can do better, I can do this for your company. Uh, lawsuits, people will try and go for you for whatever reason, you know, even if you just look at them the wrong way. Uh, you know, it's, it's crazy, you know, this world, I, in, in Hollywood, you know, it, it's a beautiful world. I call it the city of angels, but I also call it the city of sin more than Vegas. Because <laughs> people are after you no matter what. And um, all you can do is learn from your mistakes, move forward no matter what, and be all that you can be. And get great entertainment lawyer. That's that's my, that's, that's my, you know. It's great advice. Great advice. <laughs> great advice. I have a great one that I'm using momentarily, and he just flops them all off and sends me a huge bill at the end of the month, and I'm cool with it. <laughs> um, yes, indeed. <laughs> so, uh, let me talk. Let me talk about the clothing lines that you currently have. Absolutely. And then we're going to transition into the influencer. Okay. Okay. All right. So, what what brands do you have? What are what lines do you have? Okay. So we have two companies. We and by the way, I know this, but I but I still want you to tell me. Of course, I'm, I, I'm yeah. happy to explain because you're the first straight man that actually wants to know about all my different lines of lingerie. So it's refreshing. <laughs> no straight man ever yeah. asks me that. Um, so you have my brand identity, Latrodectus, which is for sexiness, um, custom fitted to the client's body. And that means what? So I know that has a I know, name. so I'm gonna explain <laughs> okay. it into a more detailed fashion. Okay. Uh, Latrodect is my first collection that I made out of my bachelor's program. I made it in my MBA program. Okay, and then I also did Fashion Week in LA for it. Okay, so that one was Latrodectus, which you can YouTube. It's on, if you go to New York Fashion Weekly, it's also there as well. You could, Latrodectus, Kayla Methvin. That was my first collection out of school. And that is where everything is custom fitted to the body hand beaded, beautiful ostrich feathers. I mean, literally every detail is is put onto her breast cup size, boning, the boning for the corsets. Now you have had a bra that sold for $1.3 million. Was that out of that collection? No, that was out of the military door. That was out of the military door. 
So that bra basically, to make it all clear for everyone to know, right. they paid for the diamonds. I designed the bra. Okay. So I just, just like to make that clear. Uh, so I interrupted you. You had your first line that you. But no, I'll explain way too much because okay, that's that's a really cool line, so, and I'll tell you how that came up. So basically, I came up with you know lash reductus. That was the first line, and then I came up with Mademoiselle. Mademoiselle is more of the boyfriend, relaxed, toned, still sexy, theatrical. You wear around the house when your boyfriend gets home, or your fiance or husband. And, you know, it's just like a little kink here and there. It's like a, you know, teaser robe. It's, it's, it's comfy, but it's still alluring to the man. He's definitely gonna wanna take you straight to the bedroom when he sees it. Uh, Lactroductus is more for wedding nights, anniversaries, um, um, Valentine's Day, his birthday, your birthday. Special events. Special events, because then it's gonna cost you, the range of Lactroductus is 5,000, anywhere to 45,000. Uh, uh, Mademoiselle is anywhere from a thousand to like three thousand. It's in, it's like a normal range of lingerie, like Agent Provocateur and uh, and Laprilla. And then Made to Adore, I came up with actually drinking tequila one night on stop with uh, my good executive manager Elodie. And um, so we came up with this thong that I had to like wear on Maximum's cover. So we're like, okay, what is something no one has? What is something amazing that no one has? So I started this a year ago. So a year ago, I decided, I said, so I got my diamond jeweler who was downtown and he uh, gets his diamonds from South Africa and they're called fancy colored diamonds. And I said, look, I need you to design me a gold, a gold triangular piece that goes down my bum basically and makes it look spectacular and I erased that off Instagram everyone because it just caught, it was too much commotion um, but I'm sure you can look at it online somewhere uh, and um, and that was that was my first actual piece that I did and it's been brilliant so now what clients come in and do for me to do is they'll take lash reductus for example, but they'll say, can you stick a diamond around my nipples? Or can you stick a diamond on my bra straps? And then that's when I make my money. Your brands are widely known to be worn by celebrities. Yes, Catherine McPhee, uh, Ava Capri, uh, Telly Swift, Barbie Blank, uh, uh, who else has worn it? Um, Jesus, uh, Demi Lovato. Uh, one that I can't say for the one point five million. Um, so, so we we transition from your your clothing is being worn by celebrities. Yes. To now your role as an influencer. No, no, you forgot my last line. L P M. Oh, you're right. So when I saw what Lady, so when I saw what Lactoductus did for other women, and they would tell me their stories, and you know they would call me and. And they would write me letters, and they were like, "Oh my God, Kayla, this is this is great. You know, you you've really changed my life around. You know, thanks for that whip and that awesome corset with feathers." I'm like, "No problem, babe." <laughs> um, so when I saw what it did for other clients, you know, I didn't want to deprive other women um, of this of this chance. You know, because I feel that all women deserve, as you know, we're all sexual creatures. We all deserve to be loved, and we all deserve to be appreciated. So I made the lady my friend. So Lady Methvin is now actually in the works. We're working with Amazon, which is really cool. Um, we just did production, and uh, we're gonna be on Amazon Prime now. So we're already on Amazon Worldwide, but we're gonna be on Amazon Prime, which is really cool, and I'm very excited about that, so you can buy it right away. And also for $24.99 a month, you can go online to my website, and you can subscribe, and you can, what we do for the stars, we now do for you. So you can custom fit your bra to your exact size. And what is your website? Oh, it's www.madan, M-A-D-A-M-E-N-E-T-H-V-E-N.com. Madanmethven.com. And you can also follow me at Madanmethven. And also in one week, my Instagram shop will be up. So you can also follow me and also my Facebook. My shop is up. Which, let's talk Instagram. Okay, Instagram. Okay, Instagram. Instagram. Now that I've you, said, uh, yeah. hold on, I didn't finish my, my Lady Method. Oh. So yes, so for all the women out there, if you're looking for customized bras and underwear, uh, fit to your size, please log on to my website, subscribe. It's only $24.99 a month, and you get a 12-piece collection for the entire year, 
and it, you get to choose your color, you get to choose your bra cup size, you get to choose everything. So it's basically like you have a live dummy basically and we're literally putting in your size points. So this is really custom fitted to you. So anyways, moving on to the influencers. Okay. Yes, how did I get a million? Well, I'm, well I want, I'll wait, I'll wait for that one. First, do you consider yourself to be an influencer? Well, people are reaching out to me now. Uh, I just got approached by a jet company to be the brand ambassador. Um, a, a, a boudoir champagne has just reached out to me as well. Um, so if I am going to be an influencer, obviously I'm not going to go with retail or clothing. I would only do luxury champagnes, jets, yachts. Um, things, things consistent with? With lingerie. Right. So maybe cigars. That's sexy. <laughs> but um, I would, you know, I really think that my Instagram is something women and men follow. One, because it's sexy. Two, because it tells a story. And three, because it's not, it's not like, it's not bullshit in the way of, look at me, look at me, I'm naked. You know, we have a lot of influencers today that are naked and put a piece of pizza in front of their private parts, you know, or or that just, you know, slightly cover their nipples. And I'm like, how, is, how are you an influencer? How does this influence the world? If I'm an influencer, you know who a real influencer is? Someone who went to the army. Or someone who saved people from, you know, a, a, a house on fire. You know, people who have actually done things with their lives. Those are influencers, but sadly, they don't get as many followers. It's only the girls that are naked, they get all these followers. So how did you get your followers? The question I cut you off on. Through the persuasion of lingerie and through my art. When you first started posting, there were runway models, your magazine covers, red carpets, some products. But about a year ago, a year and a half ago, you were starting to feature yourself more. True. Conscious decision? Um, no, actually, it's, you know, my publicist was like, you know, she was like, we need to push you more out there. I want, and, and people just, it started off basically with modeling. Uh, they were like, hey, you, go model. And I was like, I'm, I'm not a model, like, I'm five foot two. Like, what are you talking about? Like, get out of here. And I had my first cover on Fam Rebel in London. And uh, they asked me to model, and I was like, okay, let's do it. My publicist gave me in the call, and she was like, uh, go. I was like, what are you talking about? She's like, go, you have to go model. So, well, I think I did okay for my first go, uh, but now, now it's like easy peasy, I can do it in my sleep. When? I think I've modeled, I've been the cover of over 30 magazines now. And most of them you have put on Instagram, correct? Yes, I put on Instagram. Some are off, some are on. Uh, the latest photos that you have, some of them, uh, some of the captions that you have, sexy isn't a shape, it's an attitude. How much of the captions that you use are part of your vision for your company as well? I think that all women should be accepted no matter what size they are. So everything that I put on Instagram, what I'm feeling that day from the heart, is basically what I let out. Because for example, you know, there are certain uh, lingerie companies that don't do the size XL, and I don't believe in that. You know, you don't know what's wrong with the woman. You don't know if this woman is ill. You don't know if she, she has a broken ankle or whatever and she can't exercise. Why doesn't she deserve to have nice lingerie? And your company does do XL. We do XXS to XXL. We believe that all women are beautiful in every shape and size. So when you're doing a, a particular photo, how far in advance do you plan this or is it how you feel at the moment? Well, it really depends on the on, on what cover I'm doing. So it really started off with Femme Rebel and then Elements picked me up and then FCM picked me up and then other people started picking me up. And um, so whatever the editor-in-chief, depending on the season, depending on what they're looking for, um, I'll tell you what's coming up next for me if you want. Yes, But, what, but what, what, what they're looking for in the season, it could be fall, winter, spring. They're going to say, this is how I need you to pose. They'll send you a mood board, and then I have a glam squad. I use my lingerie, uh, or I'll make it even for the cover, and then, boom, I go and I shoot. And how many of those 
Well, first, the the photo, the non-cover photos. Who takes those? Oh, I, I've worked with so many photographers, beautiful ones. Uh, Ryan Dwyer, um, Irvin, Devin. Uh, Devin just shot me as his thing. Uh, Instagram. Uh, who else? Uh, Victoria. Uh, she owns Basic Magazine. It's, I've, I've, how, I've worked with the top. How long does it take to set up one of your shoots? A day. A full day. Yeah, not not a full day even. Like an hour, like a call sheet. Basically, with like I would say two hours, you get the location. We already know what clothes are going. We have the staff on call always, you know. Um, and um, yeah, we just get the inspiration, the mood board, and we get ready. I get I get up very early um, in the morning, and I also starve myself a week before to hit the gym. You know, a week before, basically, I call it the uh, very fast diet, and then I go to In and Out, um, and I'm actually on that diet right now. But uh, yeah, so it it no yeah, Elodie puts Elodie is the one who really puts it together for me. On uh, she she usually takes a day. And then to get the images photoshopped and out in the magazine takes a couple months, obviously, because, you know, it has to go through print, it has to go through this, so, right. but, yeah. Where do you see this going for you, the whole influencer, the Instagram and the social I'm media? changing it now. I, I, I've decided to change it now. Um, I want my brand to be viewed a little differently. Um, I'm still going to model lingerie, but I'm being a little bit more cautious in the way I represent myself. I've um, let go of some of my provocative photos um, lately because I've been trying to move more into the world of entertainment right now and I don't want it to affect the way people view me. So I'm keeping it sexy, I'm keeping my brand heritage. I will always be Madame Methven, but I will always keep it, I'm keeping it in a classic Marilyn Monroe way instead of a more pornographic way. So I started off with very sexual photos when I did the influencing to build the followers, as any woman would. But now that I have that following, I'm like, I have this power, use it to a good cause. So, you, go ahead. No, 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 it's oh, fine. You said you... So now I'm going to use it, um, I'm going to use it more for beneficial reasons and more for entertainment and just more I'm still gonna now I'm gonna do more product shots there are gonna be a lot more product shots and more candid shots of me so my Instagram is now gonna change it's gonna be less of me posing and more of me more out in the entertainment world you said earlier that you had to turn off your comments I did I did have to turn off my comments on a scale of 1 to 10 10 being uh, let's just say I received 12 dozen roses in my apartment one day is that enough for you? <laughs> there you go. We turned it off. <laughs> we turned it off. <laughs> That's how bad it got. <laughs> I mean, even Valentine's Day or like we'll get weird letters right. in the mail. I still get it. And I don't know where they get my address from. I don't know how this happens. It, how long ago did you have to turn it off? Uh, about six months ago. Six months. Yeah. That's when it started to get a little hasty. I'll probably turn it back on, I think, once the, you know, I, I think once my photos start clearing and becoming a little bit more, uh, more centrally seductive and less provocative and more elegant, I think I'll, I'm going to let that turn back well, it on. Is, it is a problem that a lot of influencers wrestle with. A, lo a lot of them do. Yeah. A lot mm -hmm. of them do. Because there's always the haters. Oh, yeah. A lot of women say, you're anorexic, you're bulimic, uh, you're sick, you're dying, go kill yourself, go commit suicide. Of the, of the, when, you, when you were looking at comments, what percentage were women, what percentage were men? Men want sex. Women are saying that you're disgusting, go kill yourself. More of the men comment. And the death threats come from the woman. And uh, that's a problem today. It's a problem with Instagram today. It is... Uh, it's not, it's not okay. And, you know, I've blocked certain words and I've tried that and it, it, and it comes in my messages or they'll find me on Facebook or they'll go through my company's email and they'll email me directly. And if I turn off my email on my Instagram, I can't get my clients that way or offers or anything. So it, it, it really is something just, you know, I think Instagram will crack down on that, but, you know, What's great about Instagram, what made them so famous, was that it was the world of freedom. So, and it's the beautiful people's social channel. 
Exactly. So, I mean, it, 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 it's sadly, it is what it is, but I'll, I will tell you this, that I'm going to make mine more into falling in love again, more into the projects that are coming up with Amazon, um, with my entertainment life, and I'm going to put more of Camila Methvin in it and Meta Methvin in it. I'm going to mix a little bit of me in the it. The real you. Yeah. I, I'm ready for that. I wasn't ready before. But now I really am ready because, you know, there is two sides to me. Um, there's Kayla and there's Madame. And Kayla has a story she hasn't told the world yet. You know, I was really happy that I was able to share it today with you at this podcast and, you know, tell you about my father and my past and falling in love and how it all started. But I'm going to start um, posting things that make me happy and other people, you know, and, and want to make people fall in love again. You know, not just photos of me in a bong. Right. You know, of course I'll throw that in there once in a while. Ever, <laughs> we talked about it earlier, but I always end with this. How can people find you? Oh, uh, very easy. Um, you can call me. My number is, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> seven, my phone number is 777hotline.com. <laughs> no, uh, it's just go to my website at www.metamethvin.com. Or you can add me on Instagram at Madame Methvin. Or you can go, you can Google me, Kayla Methvin, K A I L A, and last name Methvin, M E T H V E N. Or you can go on my Facebook and you can also shop there at um, Kayla Methvin. And there's Kayla Methvin too now because my Facebook got added up. And uh, you can also um, reach uh, my executive manager um, email through. Email at cfo at metamethvin.com uh, or myself at ceo at metamethvin.com if you would like to send a straight email, if you have any comments or you would like to have a consultation or just, just want to talk, I am always here for you. Thank you. It has been a pleasure. John, thank you. I had a lovely time. We are back. We have an addendum. Yes, and I'm so sorry. You can find me at now PRLA. Um, for my for my brand and my clothing, and you can find me ask for Tash, and you can ask for Eve at Yes Public Relations. So thank you, everyone. Thanks. That's it for this time. If you enjoyed our podcast, please write a review on iTunes and tell your friends to subscribe. If you have any questions about influencers or suggestions for future episodes, email them to John at pfeiffer at pfeifferlaw.com. Thank you for listening.